All right, let's get started. Uh, hello and welcome everyone to our session today, Taking Civic Action with Zines. My name is Philippa Rappaport. I'm the lead for education and engagement at the Smithsonian Office of Educational Technology, which is a central education office at the Smithsonian and the office behind the Smithsonian Learning Lab. Um, I'm joined today by Eden Cho. She's an education technologist at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History. And then also Tess Porter is a user experience strategist in the Office of Educational Technology. Tess is working behind the scenes, so you'll see her in the chat. And then also our friend Joy is providing captions today. So thank you um, everyone who's presenting behind the scenes and being here in the audience. In our session today, Eden will talk about techniques to help educators incorporate museum objects and art skills to engage their students civically. She'll share techniques honed from the museum's annual National Youth Summit. That's a program that brings together secondary students to participate in a national conversation about important events in America's past that have relevance to the nation's present and future. You'll leave this session today with resources and strategies to incorporate museum objects in the classroom, to create zines, and to encourage students to engage in civic action. Eden is the education technologist at the uh, National Museum of American History on their pre-K-12 education team. She manages the learning digital platforms and supports the development and dissemination of pre-K 12 resources. The content that she'll discuss today comes from years of work at the museum's annual National Youth Summit program. And she'll reference specifically the 2021 Summit on Gender Equity. That was a program that was connected to an exhibition, Girlhood, It's Complicated that was on view at the museum from 2020 to 2022 and is now currently traveling to a select number of museums across the country. So a few logistics before we dive in. Um, if you'd like live captions, you can um, just click on show caption on your menu bar. Uh, we'd love for this to be an interactive session, so please share your ideas and comments in the chat. We'll monitor that chat throughout the session. Um, please make sure to make your comments visible to everyone, not just the hosts and panelists. And then if you have questions at any time, you can add those in the Q&A and we'll answer those questions either during the session or if not during the session, then certainly at the end. So as we get started, please feel free to introduce yourselves. It looks like some of you are already doing that. Excellent. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Um, so the Learning Lab is a free online platform where you can discover digital museum resources from across the Smithsonian, and then you can create interactive learning experiences with them and then share these discoveries and creations with others. We'll be sharing resources today that are in the Smithsonian Learning Lab. And any links that we share today are, we've put that all into one Learning Lab collection and we'll put that link in the chat and we'll also walk you, oh, Tess just did. And we'll um, walk through that collection together um, toward the end of our session today. <clears throat> The Learning Lab offers a range of online learning to support you. So um, what you're looking at here is our help page. You can access that from the, the bottom of any page that you're on in the Learning Lab by clicking on the Get Started link. Um, and here you'll find step-by-step -step instructions to do really anything you wanna do in the lab. And it also includes um, a connection to our YouTube series where we have short videos describing how to do basically anything in the lab, okay? Also here you can access, if you were to click on the webinars and events link, this would take you to our professional development webinars and events page. And here 
is where um, you'll find the archived version of today's session. So we'll have that up um, as soon as possible, usually within 24 hours. Um, okay. Uh, so, oh, I wanted to talk just to let you know, we do have our upcoming sessions for the rest of the spring. So in April, April 24th, we'll have a session with Anne Helmreich, who's the director of the Archives of American Art. And she will be talking about developing information literacy. And then in June, Tuesday, June 4th, we have another session um, on developing family literacy. And this one is with Beth Evans from the National Portrait Gallery and Micheline Lavalier, who is um, works with the Fairfax County Public Schools Family Literacy Program. So we hope to see you at those sessions as well. Reminder that this session is being recorded. That's how we get our archived version. And um, to turn it over to Eden, Eden, I'd like to throw out a question for you all. And the question to get us started today is, how do people participate in civic action? And turn it over to Eden. Thank you, Philippa. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Eden Cho. I'm an educator at the National Museum of American History. If you're all joining us while you're on spring break, thank you. Um, I actually see a few familiar names in the chat, so I'm really excited. Um, Philippa, if you could go to the next slide, please. Our mission statement at the museum is to empower people to create a just and compassionate future by exploring, preserving, and sharing the complexity of our past. And so um, on the pre-K to 12 education team, everything that we do from creating resources and providing professional development opportunities um, furthers this mission statement. Next slide, please. Our goal for today is to understand how to engage students in civic learning and action using museum resources and strategies. Next slide, please. Um, and how we'll spend our time together is to review our invitation, um, talk briefly about object-based learning, and spend most of our time on civic engagement. So, um, how do people participate in civic action? I think um, on the next slide, Philippa, I put this question up again, um, and... I'd love to hear from everyone in the chat about some examples of participating in civic action. Um, Philippa, maybe you can kick us off with how do you participate? Uh, by voting. Oh, so <laughs> someone just wrote people can vote. <laughs> we are how in about the helping here. people register to vote. Yep. Um, I see Terry wrote also marching, protesting, keeping up to date with current events. Um, love it. Civil disobedience, participating in PACs. Yep. Yes. Attending town meetings. Um, local issues and local elections are just as important as national ones. Keep, keep them coming in the chat. I love these examples. Um, before we dive into civic engagement, I like to talk briefly about object-based learning and how we can use museum objects in the classroom. Next slide, please. So, Philippa, before our presentation today, I asked you to prepare one object that you carry with you every day that's representative of who you are as a person not an object that's the most important to you or the most used object, but an object that symbolizes who you are. Can you tell us a little bit about your object? You're muted. Thank you. I recently had to get new glasses because I had to change from reading glasses to um, whatever you call them that you can see 
far and near in the same lenses. And I find that I'm switching back and forth from all of these different glasses. But the reason I thought to use it today is because it reminds me of what I do in our work in the museum, which is that it's constantly a process of looking and looking again and testing something out and then taking another look at it. And, um, and I really strive to take that sense of curiosity and observation into the rest of my life. Thank you for sharing. Um, I love that. And we will definitely be looking and closely observing a lot um, during our session today. So many people assume that we only have very historic and old objects in our collections. And that is true. We do have objects like the Star Spangled Banner and the ink stand that Lincoln used to draft the Emancipation Proclamation. But history is happening every day which means we collect objects in the present that signifies or symbolizes an, an important moment in time. Um, next slide, please. We have an object in our collections. And before we jump into learning about this object, we're going to pause and observe. We'll practice the see, think, wonder routine from Harvard University's Project Zero Thinking Routine that encourages students to make careful observations and thoughtful interpretations. So on the next slide um, is our object. And if you could put in the chat, um, we'll start with the first question, what do you see? And Philippa, maybe you could um, also start us off with what you see with your glasses. <laughs> I see um, something that looks soft and smushy and kind of makes me want to just run my fingers into it and feel what it feels like. Yeah, texture is very important. Um, Pearl wrote an orange scarf in the chat. Ooh, Sheila also wrote um, something to keep me warm. Um, I love that Amy wrote specifically that it looks knitted. So maybe someone made it. Um, what about the second question? What do you think about that? What do you think about what you're seeing? Oh, Dorothy wrote that maybe it took time and care to create it. I love that people are like wanting to feel the scarf with their hands. Um, oh, Roxanne wrote, who, who would have worn it? Yeah. Oh, we have a difference in opinion. Alex said, I think it is scratchy. So maybe it's not soft. Maybe it's actually something that kind of itches our skin. All right, and last question, what does it make you wonder? Yeah, very important questions. Who made it and why did they make it? Oh, how long did it take to make it? Was it dyed? What technique was used? Questions about the material. Oh, does the color orange have any significance? 
These are all really great questions. Um, I hope to answer some of them. I don't know about all of them. Um, I definitely cannot tell you if it's soft or itchy because I've never touched this object. Um, but Philippa, if you go to the next slide, we have an image of the person who wore it. Um, on March 24th, 2018, Naomi Wadler delivered a speech at the March for Our Lives rally in Washington, D.C., where in her speech, she highlighted how African-American women who are victims of gun violence do not receive the same level of media attention and news. She was 11 years old at the time, and she originally wanted to wear an all-Black outfit to reflect the seriousness of the protest, but her aunt, Leslie Wadler, thought Naomi looked too somber and needed some color. And um, if you didn't know, orange is the color for the, uh, for the gun prevention movement. And her aunt knitted a scarf while she watched two movies, um, later nicknaming the scarf the two-movie scarf. And the orange bright infinity Scarf became Naomi Wadler's signature and a recognizable symbol for her speech and activism. Next slide, please. Um, Naomi Wadler was a panelist at two of the National Youth Summit programs, once in 2019 on women's suffrage, the ballot and beyond, and once again in 2021 on gender equity. As Philippa mentioned at the start of the session, um, the Youth Summit brings together middle and high school students with scholars, teachers, policy experts, activists in, in a national conversation about important events in America's past that have relevance to the nation's present and future. Next slide, please. So um, examples of past topics also included teen resistance to systemic racism, in which we featured the story of Claudette Colvin, um, Japanese American incarceration, and democracy, the stories we tell. Next slide. And in 2020, the museum opened an exhibit called Girlhood. It's complicated. Um, and although definitions of girlhood have changed, what it means to grow up female in the United States have always been part of the American conversation. Often overlooked, girls have a long history of political and social action. They have been change makers and disruptors, and they have changed history. The exhibition unpacks the diversity of girls' experiences at the intersections of gender, race, and class examining the theme through five lenses, education, work, health and wellness, news and politics, and fashion. Next slide. We had a central question for our youth summit. Um, what will the future of gender equity look like? And to build to the central question, we had four supporting questions that anchored the four panel discussions. How is gender equity shaped by race, ethnicity, and class? How can gendered expectations shape what we think we can do for fun? What strategies can we use to identify gender inequities and disrupt gender bias? And how can sharing culture create welcoming and equitable spaces for people across the gender spectrum? Next slide. The four panel discussions were live streamed. They featured museum curators, academics, people whose objects are featured in the exhibit, like Cindy Whitehead, Judy Oyama, and um, my personal favorite, Minnie Jean Brown Turkey, and some young people who are doing some really cool things um, as activists, like Naomi Wadler. We try to involve young people as much as we can, and I'm happy to announce that the 2024 National Youth Summit this September will be a program created for teens by teens. We have a great group of teens from across the country that make up the youth leadership team that are informing this year's work and planning of this year's Youth Summit. Um, and if you see the name Pearl Annie in the chat, she is actually our youth team um, coordinator. And I'm so happy that she's joining us tonight. Um, if you have any questions, you can direct them all to Pearl. 
Um, next question or next slide, please. We like to end our youth summit programs with a call to action. We've shared stories, we've discussed what's next, right? Um, one way is to use our voice. At the end of the 2021 summit, we had two workshops, one on engaging fearlessly and one on scene making. We all might be aging ourselves here, but if you've ever heard of zines, read a zine, or perhaps created a zine, please drop them in the chat. I'd love to hear your experiences. And in the meantime, um, we will watch a short, vid a short video on the history of zines. Let me know if, if the sound doesn't work, but it should. Throughout history, adults have often told girls to be seen and not heard. But girls have always found new ways to speak up and share their ideas. One of the most powerful and authentic forms of self-expression available to girls have been zines. Zines are homemade magazines that are known for their use of scrappy graphics, forthright language, and remixing of consumer culture. In a pre-internet age, girls made zines to share ideas and form new communities. They took off during the 1980s punk scene and were often associated with bands. And in the zines that came out of the Riot Girl and third wave feminism movements of the 1990s, we see and hear the voices of girls as political entities. Using words, images, and humor, they called out misogyny, sexism, and inequality, talked about niche experiences that were often ignored by the mainstream media, and developed exciting new ways to communicate. By chopping up and reassembling all aspects of their identities, zine creators taught us that girlhood is not fixed, but is constantly changing and is influenced by everything from race, to class, to sexuality. Simple to make, easy to reproduce, and affordable to buy, most importantly, zines ensured that girls' voices were heard. And in today's digital age, girls are finding new ways to create and share zines online. What would you want to say with a zine? Thank you. Um, so zines are one way or one format to use our voice and express ourselves. Um, and I love reading all of your comments about um, your experiences with zines. It's, if you still have them of like ones that you've created, please email them to us. Um, our team, we love kind of seeing what everyone's doing in the classroom or in your lives. Um, next slide, please, Philippa. So this is an image of a zine from our arc from our archive center. Um, and if you didn't know, we have an archive center and a transcription center. Um, Philippa, what do you see here? Can you read the transcribed material for us? Sure. <clears throat> a tribute to women who are beautiful, both inside and out for being super amazing and intense, for rocking my world harder than anyone. Being a woman feels good and loving all friends, lovers, sisters, and mothers does too. Thank you. Um, so as we look at scenes, we want to use our careful observational skills to better understand the writer's story. And um, I think I have some questions in the next slide that will guide our conversation. Um, so Philippa, what elements stand out to you? What story do you think the writer is telling? Um, I, I, what, what really stands out to me is just her body posture. She's just like exuding joy and it's really infectious right it's just so happy and joyful and powerful let's see if uh, it looks like some other messages may be coming in also hmm. yeah so that stands out to me and just it almost yells with joy I know 
Yeah, I, I love that this messaging is not necessarily political. Um, I love that Melanie in the chat said that they created a zine of recipes um, for their daughter, which like it can be about anything, right? Um, and so the way we share information and use our voice might look different today. Young people might be using social media like Instagram and TikTok to share their opinions. Um, and although zines might not be as popular today as they were in the 80s and 90s, people still create them. At the beginning of the workshop um, or today's session, I asked how do people participate in civic action? And many people, when they hear words like civic action and civic engagement, they think it must be a political act. It must be about campaigning and voting, serving jury duty. And these are all really, really great examples of being civically engaged. But a lot of our students are not of voting age. So how do we encourage them to be active and participating members of our community? For our youngest and earliest learners like two, three, four-year-olds, it might be learning to hold the door open for a friend. Um, it might be learning about different community members, like who's the person delivering our mail every day? And as our students get older, it might be volunteering with their caregivers or researching the social issues that impact their communities. Um, it might be discussing important events and raising awareness within their um, group of friends and families. So as we close out our session and our time together, um, I have two reflection questions for you. Um, Philippa, if you, thank you. Um, you can answer both or one, I think we'll answer one at a time. Um, and the first is, how might you be able to use one of these strategies or resources in your classroom? Oh, I love that Kara is like taking the see, think, wonder and kind of applying it to um, the zine from the archive center. Yeah, who made it, why, what's on the previous page, the next page. These are all really great questions. Um, I wish I had the answers to them. <laughs> there was another really nice comment that came in above also just to the, um, it was not to everyone that I thought I could read out. Where is it? Um, oh, Allison said, I used to write a zine when I was in high school. I'm 45 now and it definitely impacted my life. It was a way for me to use my voice as a shy kid. I talked about music, culture, but also my life. It helped me connect with people and build community. They are certainly um, a labor of love, I think. Um, we have a phenomenal intern on our pre-K to 12 team this year. Um, shout out to Taylor from College Park, University of Maryland College Park. Um, and she helped me make a zine one day in the office. And it took both of us a long time, like longer than we had expected, because we wanted to be very thoughtful and purposeful um, with, with our messaging. We wanted it to be intentional. Um, we had like, it was very like pocket size book. So just like the act of cutting and gluing was, um, it was, it took time. I and see I we've gotten some answers in the chat. Would you like me to read those or? <clears throat> yes, please. What stands out to you? In the, from the chat, you mean? Mm -hmm. We actually have quite a lot. I have to scroll up pretty far. Oh, I love that Kara said that it would be a good alternative to assessment. Yes. Hmm.
So we have all kinds of answers. I guess people are reading them too, but having students make zines on something that's important to them in their everyday lives, connecting to community issues, uh, showing the scarf um, to classes and the video recording as um, of talking about saving objects as artifacts for the future. Um, let's see. An option for differentiated responses. They could be used to build community as well. They could be part of community development strategies across generations and within generations. Melanie also wrote, um, studying the period of time in which scenes originated. Yeah, I I find it hilarious that young people will be like, oh, the 80s and 90s were so long ago. And I'm like, do you know that you're wearing flare jeans right now? And that's what I used to wear growing up. Like, it really was not that long ago. Um. So my second debrief question, if you could go to the next slide, is how might you invite your students to participate in civic action? And yes. Definitely see creating zines count um, for sure to express their emotions, beliefs, and so social cultural values from Peter. Yep, volunteering. Oh, a junior civic organization like Main Street America Junior. Huh partnering with local or state government to have students shadow elected officials for a day. Yep, learning about the issues they care about um, or even just raising questions like, why do I live in a food desert? Or why is littering so pervasive in my neighborhood? Talking with neighbors, yes. I, I've been trying to get my neighbors to um, start composting so that we could have like an official compost pickup from our county. It has not been successful, but you know, you just gotta keep chipping away. Picking up trash, participating in cleanups. These are really, really great examples. Oh my gosh, yes, oral histories of community members. Um, we have a really great oral historian on staff who um, just, I think like the questions that they raise and ask and the stories that they collect is so powerful. Um, keep them coming um, while you're dropping them in the chat. Um, I thought I'd like to share two resources we have for you today. Um, one is a step-by-step -step instructional tutorial to create scenes. Um, we have something called open access now where you can download and Photoshop and remix a lot of our images from our museum collections for educational use. 
Um, the zine making educator tutorial includes directions on how to create zines, both old school on paper, but also digitally. If you have students who are really into graphic arts and you just can't get them off a computer. Another resource we have is called Young People Shake Up Elections, History Proof Proves It. Um, and this is on the next slide. It was developed in 2020 in the lead up to the fall of the 2020 elections when somewhere around um, 15 to 20 million young people became eligible to vote. We wanted to unravel back to history and think about the history of elections and how young people have been part of elections with and without the vote. Um, and what we found was that young people have been instrumental since the beginning. Um, sometimes by voting, but other times by also helping with registration, talking to family members, um, campaigning, just paying attention to the news and engaging in discussions. So this is a series of five videos in which teens spent a week with us at the museum behind the scenes with curators um, to learn about the history. And then they sat with one another to talk about what they learned and what they thought about it. Um, and our last slide is, do you have any questions? Um, please email us if you miss any of the links today or you wanna keep the conversation going or you wanna share the zine that you created when you were in high school or you wanna share the zines that your students create, please share them with us. Um, and then the QR code leads to our newsletter. This is the, um, the best way to be informed about this year's youth summit and also just things that are happening at the museum. And Philippa, I know um, we also have an accompanying learning lab collection. Yeah. Okay. So I thought um, as we head into our Q and A, um, Eden, I was hoping you could just walk folks through what's in the collection here. Sure. So um, we have first exploring a few of the activities. So for all of you who said you wanted to share the scarf and um, sort of the story behind it with your students, we have a link to it, um, to our museum collections. Um, we also, I also put in like the video, um, I, Philippa, Philippa put in the links to the video <laughs> and the link to um, the educator tutorial guide for scene making. Um, if you're having any issues accessing these, try um, going into it incognito mode. Um, that'll help with kind of the loading um, and then also learning and teaching techniques. Um, we did practice see, think, wonder, but um, pro the Project Zero thinking routine, there's um, so many other thinking routines that you could do with your students um, that I find also really helpful. So please go to their website. Um, and then just additional museum resources that are connected to civic learning um, include the Youth Summit. Um, we have a conversation kit on Cindy Whitehead's skateboard. Um, the skateboard was part of the Girlhood It's Complicated exhibit um, and kind of goes deeper into what you're seeing, the stories behind it, why this is an object of importance um, and then a few more short videos that you could share with your students. They're like two to three minutes bite size. Um, so super digestible, does not take long. Um, and then again, additional resources for you as a teacher. Cool. And then once the um, session is archived, we'll put it into this collection too. So you'll have everything in one place. Um, there is uh, one question that that came in. Um, there are a lot of good ideas in the chat. Can you share it? I think that I can. Maybe I'll add them to the uh, collection. Do you mean, Krista, do you mean the answers that came in that, that everyone could read? You would like to access them later?
Yes. Yes. Okay. I'll try to uh, scoop some of those up and put them into the collection because I don't think it shows up in the um, YouTube archive version. Anything else? Just a huge thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you to Philippa and Tess and Joy for working in front of the screen and behind the screen to make sure everything runs smoothly tonight. Great. I'm just looking in case any other questions come in. Um, oh, you have an interesting question, Eden, from Moss. Uh, I wanted to know what drew you to working as an education technologist at the Museum of American History. Um, it, first and foremost, I needed a job. <laughs> um, but this is something I've always wanted to do. And it's something that I studied for. My background is in art history and museum studies. And um, maybe intentionally, Mostly unintentionally, I began working in a lot of educational spaces. So the way that I was building my career, just more and more, it became um, museum education. And when this opportunity um, opened for me to kind of combine all of my, my skills together, um, I, I jumped at the chance. Great. Anything else? Um, if anyone has a, their hand raised, you, you could just put your question in the chat or to the Q&A, please. All right. Well, Thank you so much, Eden, for joining us today and to everyone in the audience who has been so wonderful with all your um, insightful comments and questions. And um, just thank you all and we hope to see you next month. <laughs>